Hey everyone, and welcome to the Weekly Marketer Podcast. Every single week, we interview deep dive experts in one of the many fields of marketing to drop huge knowledge bombs from the best of the best and teach you how to take your marketing skills to the next level. This is episode 20, and I'm sitting with Rich Miller, who is a self-taught marketer. He started off by going the MBA finance route, decided that he hated that, and built his own dog walking company instead. He scaled that from just himself to a 10 employee business, and then later co-founded the SaaS company Scout, which is a platform and suite of tools for dog walking companies. He's going to talk about his his journey as a marketer and what he's learned along the way. Rich, thanks for being here with us. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah, so that's that's quite the journey. <laughs> you said you were an auditor, right? Back in the day before you started this whole entrepreneurial journey, is that right? Yeah, that's true. I was doing uh, compliance audits for Fortune 500 companies and just didn't really, I don't know, I didn't feel like it was my path, I guess. I always had a passion for working with animals. My sister-in-law is a dog trainer, so I've always like talked to her about that kind of thing and just decided one day that I had had enough and left the company and started my dog walking business. Yeah. So that that's kind of crazy though. So like kind of just high level. You've kind of had experience in marketing from like the, you know, obviously not like you were an auditor, right? But like you went to business school and stuff. And so you got that side of marketing or at least you were exposed to it. And then you went the like local services company route. And then, you know, kind of got into like the technology software as a service space. And so like a really, really diverse kind of set of experiences in regards to, you know, marketing, I guess. You now, could you kind of talk about kind of the business school, like start at the beginning, you know, what was kind of your first exposure to like marketing stuff because you know i think that it's really interesting to talk about you know like i said kind of your journey and your understanding and the different context that you've seen it in as well as the self-taught aspect you know i think from just a historical perspective we're going back to you know the late 90s early 2000s pre-facebook i mean the iphone didn't even exist i think apple was like a failing company at the time <laughs> You know, so just to put that in perspective, a lot of what we were learning in marketing was like traditional, you know, how to segment a market, how to identify your target audience, like very simple intro to marketing type courses, nothing too crazy as far as my schooling went, you know, just the basic things you would take as like a finance major, having to get a well-rounded education. Sure. So that that's interesting that you say that, you know, what's kind of the, the focus there is like, like you said, like trying to how to segment a market and things like that. Can you dive a little bit more into what they're teaching and or what they were teaching in, you know, kind of business school back in the day or about marketing? Yeah, sure. I mean, we're going back now t- almost 20 years, but really it, it was about how really to just build your personas about your target market. So identify, you know, who a potential buyer is, what problem is the product trying to solve, and how can you communicate that effectively. My school revolved around a lot of group projects. So it was real hands on, we would have like a case study that we would read, and then we'd have to put together a presentation as if we were trying to sell something to a customer or business related to the case study. So nothing like too in depth that, you know, I was an obviously a finance major. So these are like my electives, but I always found it really interesting. I always found the psychological aspect of it really interesting, just how you market differently to different segments of the population and you create those groups and your your message is crafted around the group that you're trying to reach. Okay. So, so you, you have like kind of your first exposure, right. To marketing in business school. Right. And, you know, like you said, you were interested in it. You took it a bunch of electives, things like that. And then you go off and be an auditor, which I have to imagine is kind of the opposite of, of marketing. I don't know though. I've never. It's super exciting. Yeah. Is it super exciting? Like, uh, yeah, yeah, no, uh, it's it's not between that and like Formula One driver when kids are yeah, growing up. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the adrenaline of like completing a work paper is right up there. <laughs> uh, it's hard to explain, but like you kind of become like one of the most hated people in the room when you're an auditor. And my job wasn't to like do tax audits and like get people fired. You know, my job was to go in and try to help companies 
improve their processes specifically around fraud prevention. No, that's interesting. So, so you obviously aren't happy with that. So how does, how does that sort of work? So you, you know, you're not super pumped up about that, right? You're looking for a change and you're like dog walking and because of your sister, right? Like, no, I mean, I'm not like, like, it's just, it's a, it's a pretty ab- abrupt change. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so I've always been a big fan of this investor named Peter Lynch. His whole like theory of investing was look around you and like take in what's going on. Uh, one of the examples from one of his books that I always loved was there was this company called I think it was like Wet Seal back in the day, and he noticed that like his wife and kids were spending a ton of money at wet seal all the time on his credit card and he invested in that company and it ended up being like an 11 X return over like the period that he held the company. And I always just thought that anecdote was like a great way to sort of approach entrepreneurship, like what's going on out in the world in the market that you see as a trend. And I just saw that, you know, the way people were treating their pets was starting to like escalate. I had a dog walker With my business, you know, I could be traveling for two weeks at a time or an emergency could come up and, you know, one of my bosses would ask me to stay till two o'clock in the morning to finish something. And I would need someone that as a single guy in his early 20s, you know, with a dog would need someone to take care of him. And I just saw what I thought was a missing piece of the puzzle. It was just real hard for me to find somebody who would come over last minute. I had this kind of like skate punk guy walking my dog and I would call him and be like, Hey man, I got to work late tonight. Like I need you to stop by and feed the dog dinner, take him out. I'm not going to be home till 2am. He'd be like, Oh man, I'd love to, but like go to the skate park later. And I'm sitting here like thinking about the fact that I pay this guy like $350 a month. And like, I really need him to not go to the skate park and go walk my dog. It's not like the whole night. Like you can do both. (laughs) So, you know, just seeing the trend and seeing, you know, how much I was spending on dog walking. I talked to all my neighbors. They all had dog walkers. And I just really wanted something where I was like not really around people all day. I like being outside, walking around. I like dogs, but like I'm not like super like into office politics and things like that. And so I just, everything together, actually, my first idea was to start a doggy daycare. And I went back, my my dad owned his own business for 35 years. So I've always kind of run things by him. And, you know, he just felt that out of the gate, that kind of investment was going to be a lot. And that I should think about something with like a little less overhead to start. And uh, dog walking is just one of those industries where the barriers to entry are just super low. So I gave it a shot. I quit my job on like July 4th. And by July 5th, I had my first client. And from there, just started building the business. No, it's super interesting. So, okay. So you start building the business, right? And obviously, when you're building a business, one of the most important things that, you know, you can do is find customers, right? So, you know, this kind of takes you from the auditing world into necessarily the marketing world, right? And, you know, I think don't be afraid to be broad with marketing, but how did you market? You know, was it like signs on poles and things like that? Word of mouth? Like, how'd you, especially in those early days, how'd you get started? They're like, okay, I'm doing this. And then, you know, there's always that moment where you sit at the desk and you're like, okay, here we are, it's happening. And then like the phone doesn't ring, nothing happens. (laughs) And then you're like, oh shit, I got to go start doing stuff. (laughs) Like, (laughs) So the first thing I did was try the mailing route direct mail, I bought a list of theoretically of dog owners in Philadelphia. And I, I designed a coupon to send out mail at the time. And I think they're still really popular. Uh, Bed Bath & Beyond coupons were like the hottest thing going uh, that I, <laughs> you know, get a million of them in the mail, the 20% off, they, you know, they're like huge. I may or may not have a giant envelope that my wife apparently is some sort of collector. <laughs> but yeah. Everyone has them. So I was like, all right, let me try something like that. My dad had had a lot of success with his business with catalog sales. So doing mailings of catalogs, you know, it's different with 
service industry. So I was like, all right, let me just like let people know I exist. So I must have spent, it's got to be like a few thousand dollars on this between like printing up all the flyers, having them like mailed with like the addresses, postage, all that. It was really expensive and it was probably the biggest marketing failure I've ever experienced. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Went that well, huh? <laughs> absolutely zero callbacks with the exception of one woman who called me to tell me never to send her anything again. Oh man, that's always rough. If it makes you feel better, usually once a day, I'm getting a, on one of my ads for one of my clients, I'm getting a, well, I hate you, blah, 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 sort of things. It just is what it is. It's the nature of it. It could be the most innocuous message of all time and you'll still get that. So <laughs> yeah, it, it definitely didn't work. I think probably a mistake was like making it look so similar to a Bed Bath & Beyond coupon. But at this point, you know, I didn't have any real like design experience. So I just went with what looked like it worked. So I mean, I used their colors. The coupon like was almost indistinguishable from theirs, which was probably a mistake in retrospect, knowing what I know now. And it just it just fell flat. So, you know, I will kind of went back to the drawing board and, and with any business as a startup, you know, it's you don't really have a lot of clients so you have more time on your hands than anything and websites were popular back then not nothing like they are now and so i thought you know let me let me learn how to make a website and this is like before you know squarespace and like all these companies that let like have drag and drop visual interfaces so i I bought, you know, Adobe Dreamweaver, I think it was, and I learned how to code HTML to some extent in my off time when I wasn't walking dogs because we were slow. And I made this absolutely horrible looking website <laughs> and it took off. I, it, I was yeah? shockingly effective. Yeah. You'd be surprised. A lot of that stuff, like it doesn't, the design, I, I still see landing pages every single day that make me cringe that are just cleaning up, <laughs> absolutely cleaning up. So, <laughs> One thing about the dog walking industry is that you get a very eclectic group of websites. Even today, I see some where I'm just like, wow, this is special. So, so you, I mean, that's, that's incredible though, honestly, to take the initiative to like, be like, okay, the web is popular. It's becoming more popular. I'm going to learn this. I'm going to, this is, this is happening. And then teaching yourself in the off time to like market your company. That's, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't, I didn't have any work and I wanted to be productive, you know, in my goals. So I just thought like, all right, like, what can I teach myself? Like save money because I'm not, I don't have any income coming in and get my name out there. So I built this terrible, terrible website. And over the next two years, it, it was really, it worked really well. You got to, at the time, there was like only one other dog walking company in Philadelphia that even had a website. And I was sort of trying to fill a different niche than they were. So what ended up happening is a, a lot of my customers came from referrals from that bigger company. You know, I had seen them around. I talked to the owner on the street, you know, told them what I was trying to do. And, you know, for customers that weren't a good fit for what they were doing, they would refer over to me. And then I would say about 75% of, of my clients came from that crappy first website. And then after about two years, uh, you know, I, I had a little money coming in. I paid a professional design team as part of, I opened a, a pet store as well at the time. And as part of designing the store, I had them go back and kind of apply all that design to the website. So they took like all the information, kind of wrapped it in a prettier package. And from there, things just started kind of going like wildfire. You know, now like every company in Philly has a website and I think I benefit from being like one of the first. So, you know, SEO for me is like fairly easy, but I, I did start to notice the competition. And so I kind of had to go back and think like, okay, now what's, what's next? Like, how can I be better than the companies around me and have more than just a website? And that was a big lesson for me that like when you find success with one thing, you can't just rely on that one thing because everybody's going to swarm to that one thing. When they see that you're successful, they're going to copy off of you. 
And so what ended up happening then is like everybody has a web page at that point. And I've always tried to like do things the right way, but then like you have companies that are like keyword packing their website with like a white background and white text. And like that became a big thing until Google cracked down on it. So like it, it was a challenge keeping my ranking. And that's when I kind of discovered blogging. And, you know, now I know it to be content marketing, but at the time, you know, I was just trying to get people interested in reading about my company and Facebook became big during this time. Like they started letting your parents on it. And once they started doing that. Yeah. That was like 2009, 10. That, they started yeah, doing probably that. Right I around think. when I started, you know, blogging was around 2011. So for me, it was just about like in my head, like I need something to put on this Facebook page that I have that doesn't do anything and I need something to put on there. I also, you know, want to get my current customers more engaged with the company from like a retention perspective. So just like an interesting medium to get into, you know, that was kind of my first dip of the foot into the content marketing pond and it worked really well. Um, and actually to this day, I spend a lot of my time trying to convince dog walkers that we work with on the software side of things to have a blog. And it's, it's kind of like pulling teeth, but once they kind of do it and see that you can be successful, especially for like local businesses, it's just super easy to gain the traction that you need with those things. Yeah. So let's, I want to go back to an interesting point that you brought up a while ago. Okay. But I think it's like actually like pretty salient. There's a really interesting, uh, how do you say, like thing that you brought up, which is the positioning sort of aspect of it, right? And I think it's it's something that, you know, a lot of marketers think about, but like, I mean, I didn't used to put a lot of weight into it and stuff. And you were talking about how you got a lot of your early business from referrals from that other company and things like that, because it just wasn't a good fit for them. And so you basically positioned in the market to be a good fit for the people that weren't good fits for the big kind of established company. So give me your thoughts on kind of positioning in like a local market for like a local services company. You know, like how do you find those opportunities? How do you understand, um, you know? I mean, I think it's almost ingrained in the entrepreneurial process, if you can call it that, where you need something for yourself and you realize that it's not out there, you know? And so you invent the thing that you need and realize other people also probably need that thing. So for me, it was about those last minute appointments and not having necessarily to schedule like five days a week in order to have a service, which was what the other company kind of required of you. So they had these like minimums where you had to have four days a week on a set schedule and like, you had to give 48 hours notice if you needed like an appointment outside of that time that you normally had. And that just didn't really work for like my hectic scheduling needs. You know, I, my dog's super friendly. So like I didn't so much care who came over as far as like, he's going to like whoever walks through the door. I just needed a body to like come that was capable and, you know, well-trained to take care of him. Right. You didn't need like the whole Cadillac package, basically. Yeah. I mean, I didn't need someone who was going to like come over 12 times before he would warm up to them or, or any of that kind of stuff. So I just started positioning myself in a way to be able to handle you know, the random needs that people have. Work from home was kind of starting to become more prevalent as well. So like the idea of being in an office for five days a week was starting to go away to some extent. And I just found a lot of clients where like I'd have this one on like Monday and Tuesday and maybe one on Wednesday and then like a different one on Thursday and Friday and I'd have some five day a week clients here and there but I was really cobbling together these like kind of last minute type people and really was able to find a niche just being super available to them all the time and then you know we don't take on pets that have behavior issues typically. So we're able to do stuff where we send over a walker who's never met the dog before because there's no like issue with going into the house blind. 
I think that like understanding that sort of positioning, right? Understanding where the gaps in the market are is really underrated part of marketing. You know, I think a lot of people like kind of shove that over to product, you know, whether it's marketing people themselves or like entrepreneurs or whatever. And they, you know, they're just like, just market it. And it's like, well, the positioning and like understanding how that interrelates with the actual offering is such a key part of marketing. So I'm glad that we touched on that. I also am glad, you know, kind of um, jumping back to where we were. I'm, I'm glad that you said, you know, not to kind of rest on your rest on your laurels, as it were, right? I'm not quite sure what a laurel actually is. But, um, uh, you know, I've been saying that forever. And it, it's true, though, because it's like, once you get something down, everybody else is going to start rushing into it, right? Especially in highly competitive local services companies, you know, I've done a lot of work for attorneys, and you you start running an ad on a platform, right? Like whether it's Facebook or whatever. And suddenly, you know, within a week, you see a bunch of others that look just like yours pop up, you know, because everybody's kind of like trying to stay ahead. And they think if somebody else is doing something, then it must be working for them. And so it turns into a giant game of me too. I think it's uh, or me also, but I think it's uh like, it's a good point that you bring up around, like, once you get something locked in, you can't just rely on that forever, right? Because that stagnation is death in business, you know, especially around the marketing stuff. Would you say that's kind of a fair reaction? Yeah, I think once you find the thing that works, you kind of like push your resources to that and then push your mind to the next thing that like you want to find that works. Right, right. I actually really like that sort of a separation that you make your resources versus your mind. Can you kind of talk about that? Like how, you know, as a self-taught marketer, right? Like how are you, you know, fine. And like for what it's worth, I largely am a self-taught marketer also. Um, you know, I've had the privilege of working with a lot of very talented people, but you know, I didn't go to school for marketing um, when I did go to school. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's kind of interesting to hear, hear your kind of journey on it. And, and, you know, I'm kind of like, when, when you, when you say that, like, can you, can you just dig in a little bit more for me? From my perspective, you spend a lot of time as a business owner trying to figure out like the next thing that works for your company to bring in more clients. And that that's a lot of energy spent doing that. And you try different things out and then kind of you figure out something that's working. And then what you want to do is put your full weight behind it. So like, you know, if it's blogging, like just get some resources to get those articles out there. If it's Facebook ads, put the money behind the Facebook ads. But that's already working. So, you know, you can just kind of put the resources to it and amplify it. But while you're doing that, you have to be on to the next thing already because like you figured this thing out. It's not worth wasting any more mental energy on it. You know, it's working. You want to move on to the next thing. The next thing might just be an iteration of that same thing you already tried, but it also might be some whole new thing that you want to do, and it's going to take a lot of mental energy to do that. So while you don't have to spend the mental energy on the other side, you can just put throw money at it, so to speak. You can put your mental energy towards the next thing that you want to do. You don't need to think about that thing you already figured out. Right. Well, So from the business owner perspective, right, you can just hire somebody like me to be like, okay, you know, I know this is going to work. I just want you to optimize it or whatever, you know, take it to its logical conclusion, you know, scale it up, whatever. Yeah. And from a small business perspective, like I might be putting some of my like time into blogging, but I'm putting my real like mental power towards the next thing like not that i don't think about the blog articles that i write but i'm not like laying awake at night like going through different things in my head or like writing down things during the day that are you know blog related necessarily it's about the next thing that i want to do like after the blog so that's sort of how i look at it. i try to divide my like mental capacity um, and focus it on the future rather than the past Right. No, that makes a lot of sense. And kind of to, I guess, clarify a point that I meant earlier, I'm, you know, I spend most of my time looking for the new opportunities as well. But there are people that, you know, are like, they just want to, you know, like, okay, I know this works, go execute. Like, you know, that sort of, uh, those sort of marketers do exist. I fall kind of more into the the exploratory, figure it out, uh, creative side of things. But um, it's interesting you saying that. So kind of all the, all those experience was the local services company. And then like kind of understanding from marketing school, 
now you're founding a SaaS company, right? Like software as a service company. What is that experience marketing like? What, you know, like tell me about the early days of Scout. I thought, okay, like I know dog walking. I know dog walkers. I know business. We're going to make this software. It's going to come out and everybody's going to love it. And we're just going to like kill it without having to do much of anything. And that could not have been further from the truth. Um, you know, nothing really works that way. It was kind of ridiculous to go into it. I wish. That. That'd be really cool if it worked that way. <laughs> yeah, it, it would have been great. I mean, we were going into an industry where we felt that it had stagnated and that from a design perspective, things weren't where they needed to be from a functionality design perspective really – is, is kind of what I'm talking about. You know, we just had this idea that like we were going to do this better than everybody. And that's all you have to do is like, if you build it, they will come. And it, you know, that's really naive. <laughs> um, so, you know, once we kind of saw the reality of the situation, which was, our software wasn't perfect for everybody. We needed to kind of do some more discovery to find out what people needed, what problems they were having. And I mean, that's a big part of marketing too, right? Is market research. So we, we really tried to get as much feedback as we could and develop the product that way. And on the other side, you know, marketing locally compared to like a national marketing campaign is so, so different the word of mouth from your community just isn't there as like a boost. So the fact that like my neighbors know that like I'm a good dog walker doesn't help me find dog walking companies that want to use our software. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You can't like, you know, some guy at like the bar sitting next to some other guy at the bar being like, oh, I got to get home and walk my dog. And it's like, you should just get a dog walker, you know, hire rich. Like that sort of thing doesn't really, yeah. doesn't really happen um, at yeah, the national level. I mean, it does then, kind of, but like not in the same way. I think it does once you reach like an inflection point. Like we're starting to notice it now that we have over like a, a hundred or so customers that we do get referrals now and people talking about us online, things like that. That's sort of social proof. Uh, but that's not there in the beginning. So, you know, it, you're also asking people to put their whole business on your system. And when you're a new company, like that's a big leap, right? Because like you're trusting someone who's like literally just never been around. Right. The whole, uh, the whole, maybe not, nobody gets fired for buying IBM, but like similar sort of idea, right? Like, you know, oh, who is this company? Are they going to go belly up in three months? Like, what is this? You know, that sort of thing. Like, that's a very real concern. Yeah, yeah. And so from the beginning, we really just tried to build this idea of like trusting us and, you know, how can we show people that we're trustworthy? How can we show them we're doing the right things to stay in business? that kind of thing. And it, it was really challenging for the first year. You know, we really didn't find much traction. Obviously, like we were, our website was newer, so we weren't showing up the way we do now in search. So we just weren't getting traffic to the site that way. And we just started kind of like, I, I don't know like if this is the appropriate term, but we, we basically started throwing shit at the wall to see what's stuck. <laughs> no, I've used that. I've used that in professional meetings where people are paying me my hourly <laughs> to be there. Like, I don't know, let's throw shit at a wall and see what sticks. Yeah. I don't and know it's if it's appreciated, really but I do it. What we were doing early on was just trying to find some bit of traction in some channel where we could get the signups that we needed to keep going. For what it's worth, I think the technical professional term is iterative testing, <laughs> but okay. Okay. it means the same thing. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's lean startup. See, we're pivoting fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, the, you brought up a lot of interesting things there, right? So like, you know, when it comes to word of mouth, which is still powerful, you have to hit some sort of inflection point. People are the, the trust factor, I think, because you're not just sitting there talking to somebody like they can trust you, the person, even if they don't know much about your business. 
kind of changes a lot at scale nationally, right? You don't have that. You can't sit down with everybody, you know. I mean, you obviously you can like call people or whatever, but you know, it's a lot harder to build that personal relationship and use kind of personal like uh how do you say like personal integrity or whatever to like kind of get a sale closed or, or whatnot, like you would local services. I think, you know, and one thing I would love for you to touch on that I've sort of noticed is the difference between kind of, and, and I don't want to like classify your dog walking services like a commodity product, but it's an understood problem. You know, people need dog walkers. You're a dog walker. You position in a certain way. It's kind of there, like take it or leave it, right? But it's a known issue. You're now inventing something new. And what's the challenges there versus marketing something that's kind of more of the understood service that exists? It's a known market versus completely building a new market around something that doesn't exist. You kind of speak to that. Yeah. I mean, there were other software companies making management software for dog walking companies when we started. So it wasn't like a completely foreign idea to people, but we did see a lot of frustration with people about like how difficult the software was to use, that their customers were finding it difficult to use, things like that. And we really, I mean, our company was born out of that frustration. I had a software I was using. Uh, James, our co-founder, was super frustrated with the experience of like booking appointments and like getting updates through my company. Like he knew we were doing a great job and knew that I really cared about his dogs and we had met and I lived down the street and all that, but it wasn't being communicated to him well. And he sort of saw that missing piece of it. And we, we talked early on, like, you know, is there other stuff out there? I was like, look, man, it's, it's all the same. Like it's not going to be any different if I switch to another software, it's just not, it's not there. So to his credit, he noticed that sort of missing piece in the in the puzzle of, of what – based on what other people were doing and like what he wanted as a pet owner. So I think the hard part wasn't like introducing people to the idea of pet sitting software. It was introducing them to the fact that like there was more out there than what they were being offered and I don't think that the – business owners and they would have no way to do this it's not a it's not a dig but they couldn't comprehend what was available like what what the possibilities were i should say so for us it was about coming in and sort of saying like i know you've had this experience with software but we're different and this is why we're different and this is what we do and a lot of the friction that we we hit is people who are like cobbling together like a combination of email and Google Calendar and doing things manually and sort of convincing them that like, hey, paying money for this software is a positive return on investment because you're in an industry based on selling your time. And if we can automate things and save you time, then you can turn that time into money. Yeah, that's interesting, actually. But do you think that you get pushback for the same reason? Like, how do you overcome that? Like, from like a marketing, um, branding sort of standpoint, right? Like, do you get pushback? We're like, oh no, I'm I'm charging based on time. So why would I do things that make it more efficient? And I know that's kind of a weird thing to think about, but like, there really is legacy pushback like that, right? Like, you know, do you run into that? How do you kind of overcome that and like actually convince people that like these things are a good thing, you know, in those cases? It helps that I own and operate like a live dog walking company still. So it, I'm able to say like, you know, I... I know what you are doing day to day because I was having to do that also. And I know what I'm able to do now with the software and how that's helped the business grow. One thing uh, we get a lot of pushback on is where people say like, oh, I build my brand based on being personable uh, with my customers. And I don't want an app where they don't, where, where there's no like, personal interaction so that's like kind of an example right of where someone's like i know this is more efficient but i want to do it the less efficient way because i perceive that it's more personable 
And I sort of push back on that by saying, you know, for me as a pet owner, not as a dog walker, I don't think communicating with you about my schedule is very personable. I find it annoying and difficult to communicate times and dates via messenger, you know, and even phone. So like what really does next Tuesday mean when it's Tuesday? Does it mean like coming Tuesday or is it the Tuesday after? And like you get in these kind of conversations with people that are like frustrating to the pet owner and just taking a lot of time and you're because you're interacting with a person, you feel like you're being personable, but in reality, like you're not being personable. Like you're just making it take longer to figure out what your customer needs. Whereas if you implement this software and they can put a request in where you see exactly what they meant when they told you what they, what time they wanted and you can approve it or not approve it, you're free to do things like send birthday cards to their pets make a few phone calls every week to check in with your customers to make sure that they're happy. Use that time to be out handing out business cards, meeting people on the street, talking to veterinarians, things like that, that are actually going to help your business, not just like facilitating the actual inner working stuff. So like you telling me like that you need a walk at four o'clock on Friday and me emailing you back saying, okay, you're all set. Like that's not personable. Like me sending you a birthday card for your pet is personable. I try to communicate, you know, that kind of thing to people and make it really practical. No, I like it. That does make a lot of sense. So, you know, I think guess kind of, I, I loved learning about kind of the breadth of everything that, you know, you've been, been experienced at all these different stages of marketing, you know, and everything and kind of how you learned self-taught, you know, just using like kind of your downtime and in, in smart ways in order to pick up, like really kind of seems like focus pick on uh, skills rather than being like, you know, just yeah, kind of randomly lashing out um, into different marketing stuff like a lot of a lot of people I see do. Um, you know, don't get me wrong, the iterative testing slash throwing shit at a wall is is valuable and I do it a lot. But, um, you know, kind of being a little bit more intentional about it, I think is, is really powerful. You know, I guess if I could ask, what are you kind of seeing people do that you really like marketing wise, you know, just kind of as a self-taught marketer, as an entrepreneur, what are you kind of seeing people like? And then what are, what are a few things that you hate that you wish people would just stop doing? You know, it's not good for them. It's not good for anybody. I mean, I love podcasts right now. I think they're awesome. I think they're a great like long format way to talk to somebody about something and teach them something where they don't have to be fully engaged with it to come away with something. So they may be at their desk working, they may be driving, something like that. And you can give them the information that they need while they're multitasking, doing something else. And I think that's really powerful to like have someone's undivided attention for 30 minutes and also let them walk away with a skit like some kind of skill or knowledge that's going to help them and they're just coming back for that over and over again if you're executing so i i think that's really interesting flattery will get you everywhere yeah. <laughs> Rich. Yeah. as we record my podcast yeah, well, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm here because i find it interesting so you know, no no i know i'm uh, teasing I like that. um i I like like guerrilla marketing a lot. I remember like we did this thing once where we went to a park and one of my pet sitters was like a great artist. So I like bought her a bunch of sidewalk chalk and like sent her to a park and she painted a huge mural of our company as like a billboard in the middle of a par- park that's like probably got a hundred dogs a day walking through it. And I love stuff like that. Like when I walk around and I see these like guerrilla marketing things people are doing, like, I mean, even these guys who are these like aspiring musicians, like you go down to South Street in Philly, I don't know if you're familiar, but it's kind of a bohemian type street and you'll run into someone who's like a recording artist and they'll be like, hey, I have this CD, like, will you listen to this song for like one second with me? And if you like it, like I'll sell you my CD. Like I love stuff like that where it's just people out like grinding it out, like trying new things and like untraditional type marketing like that. I think that stuff's really cool. I, uh, as far as stuff that annoys me, I mean, 
to me, like the email marketing can get like way out of hand, especially when your business is email heavy. And so you have like a lot of important emails coming through and then like just everything in the world that you've ever signed up with, people are like emailing you about stuff or it's spam emails where you never signed up for anything. Oh yeah. Those Um, are the worst ones. I find that annoying and only superseded by this new, like, voicemail injection and like robo calling uh oh yeah yeah (laughs) yeah i think that yeah those are pretty horrendous hopefully the uh fcc supposedly they're cracking down on it but i mean I, i bought an app from my cell phone provider that does a good job like telling me that it's spam and a robo call but I, I still got to look at my phone. And inter- I can't believe those things actually work, to be honest. But I think it's just crowdsourced, if I had to guess. I, I mean, I don't know how they do it, but I think if like enough people block a phone number, they just add it to the list. Yeah, that's fascinating. Cool. Well, Rich, I super, super appreciate the time that you've given us today. This has been absolutely fascinating and lightning, just your diverse sort of experiences in the marketing world and, you know, kind of coming from kind of really old school sort of approach to like being very on the cutting edge of technology. Um, You know, I think it's really appreciated. I know I've learned a lot. I think all of my listeners have learned a lot. Um, You know, I just always give my uh, guest a uh, quick like two minute pitch that they can do at the end of uh, the episode. Pitch anything you want. Most popular, obviously, is their company or their service. But I also have a lot of people that pitch, um, you know, things like charities or, or what have you, you know. So um, I'll just let you um, go ahead and do that. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure how many people in the dog walking pet sitting industry are out there listening. But, you know, if if you are, I would certainly love for you to uh, – Visit uh, www.scoutforpets.com. Check out our website. Check out our software. We really pride ourselves in customer service as actually as a marketing tool. And, you know, we'd love to to talk to you about your business, find out more about what you're doing uh, and see how Scout can help you. Um, We do uh, actually put charity uh, very high up on our list of priorities at Scout. Uh, We've been working um, for a number of months with Colorado Pet Pantry in Denver, Colorado, and they run a pet food bank in parallel with human food banks. So when families in need come to get food for themselves, they can also get food for their dogs. It's a great way to reduce the number of pets that are in shelters um, just because they never end up there in the first place, which is like the best way to save the resources of those uh, institutions. Really love them, what they're doing. I'd love to see more of it uh, around the country. And if you're interested, definitely check out Colorado Pet Pantry. Yeah, wonderful. Well, I really appreciate that. Rich, thank you so much for being here, truly. Um, And for everybody listening, take these lessons, you know, apply them to yourselves. This is not some in their ivory tower marketer working with huge budgets. This is somebody that's lived it, breathed it, figured it out on their own. If he can do it, you can do it, or most of you. (laughs) Um, So thank you all for listening and happy marketing, everybody. 